This is the Media Police Post, broadcasting from the Fort Hall School of Government in Nairobi, Kenya. In this show, we police the state of truth in the Republic. And because truth is communicated to us by journalists and analysts, we have made it our civic duty to put it to the test. We advance from two confirmed truths about the media. One, and according to Roger Stone, the media is either lazy or evil. And for the most part, it is both evil and lazy. That is why the truth, their truth, must be put to a test. And two, that journalism is verified gossip. In fact, what is presented to us as news analysis is gossip that has been verified by journalists. Mm -hmm. This gossip has to be ground truthed. We will assess the state of truth in what they submit to the Republic and we will pass verdict on what is true and what is not. For the record, we are not journalists. We are thinkers. We are not lazy or evil and we do not verify gossip. What we give you is a truth the truth that sets you free. So on today's show, we will discuss ideas that reflect unformed and uninformed opinions and ideas that made you stupid. <laughs> Narratives that fell into the cognitive trap of we see things as they, as we are and not as they are. Narratives based on conjecture history and those that smack of envelope journalism. Welcome AX and Miss Kitty. Thank, Thank you. you. So today I will be interrogating Arumu Kangata's piece in the Sunday Nation. In an article titled, Could Uhuru Be Subtly Helping Ruto Win Top Seat? Kangata hypothesizes that President Uhuru Kenyatta is using reverse psychology to attract the masses to William Ruto. <laughs> now for the uninitiated, reverse psychology is a persuasive technique that involves getting someone to engage Engage in the desired action or response by suggesting the opposite. Mm -hmm. And according to Kangata, every denunciation of, every explicit warning offered against, and every possible rebuke laid at the feet of William Ruto was an act of reverse psychology. This is because the president knew that country would never go for his chosen successor, and so he had to cloak his true preferences with schoolyard psychology. This means that Kangata, Kangata is hypothesizing that the president's chosen successor is Ruto. Despite three years of explicit, unequivocal, unwavering communication otherwise. <laughs> and today, I would like to tell you why his hypothesis should be dismissed mm -hmm. on the basis of science. Mm. Now, in science, political or natural, when a hypothesis meets, um, it needs to meet a minimum standard, and mm. this minimum standard is called falsifiability. Mm -hmm. Now, science philosopher Karl Popper argued that falsifiability is central from differentiating science from non-science. Mm. A system, he wrote, is to be considered as scientific only if it makes assertions which may clash with observations. Put simply, you must be able to prove the hypothesis wrong as well as prove it right. Mm. This is the standard that Kangata's hypothesis must meet, and predictably, it falls short. <laughs> His hypothesis is untestable. It is untestable because every counter argument I might propose, like President Kenyatta denying Ruto the opportunity to speak at Madaraka Day, or his, or his explicit dismissal of Ruto at Sagana 3, can be countered with the cry of reverse psychology. <laughs> so how do we disprove Kangata if everything proves his argument to be right? You cannot. <laughs> and this means that on the basis of good science, Kangata's hypothesis should be dismissed. Mm -hmm. If, therefore, Kangata's argument is not good science, then why did he write it? Mm -hmm. Why is he working so hard to link the president and Ruto, going as far as to rewrite history itself? Is this a sign that he believes Ruto needs the president's support in order to win? For if the president were as inconsequential to the elections as Kenya Kwisha believed, <laughs> then Kangata would not waste ink trying to make the case for a secret endorsement. Mm. So the fact that Kangata tried speaks volumes about how Ruto's camp view the president and his ability to sway voters in the 2022 election. Mm. The only question is, why now? Why try to make this argument less than 50 days to the polls? Is it because the president has largely been quiet on matters politics mm. and in this silence lies an opportunity to speak for him? Mm. Or is it because Kenya Kwisha is desperate to turn the tide? To have a leader overwrite Kashagwa's repulsion of Gemma and the votes that this that and the votes that his presence on the on the ticket has cost Ruto. After all, since Kashagwa joined the ticket, Ruto's popularity has fallen four percent in a month mm. nationwide and seven percent in Mount Kenya alone, at least according to InfoTrack. Mm. Might desperation be the answer for this audacious attempt to rewrite reality? Interesting. Possibly. Like mm -hmm. I'd like to change tact a little bit and not talk about the persons, but the institutions 
elections yes. on the election. So today I'd like to talk about a column published in The Elephant titled Roads to 9-8 Risks Posed by Digitization of Electoral Processes by Karim Anjawala and Abdul Malik Sugo. Mm -hmm. The column is part of a series discussing the issues and institutions at play in the 2022 electoral cycle. And in our view, this column identifies some critical issues within IEBC that could impact the process and mm -hmm. outcome of the 2022 election. Mm -hmm. These issues, especially those on the use of technology in our election, are worth some analysis. Yes. Now, in 2013 and 2017, the use of technology in the presidential election was both contentious and controversial. Mm -hmm. The failure of the system, both times, and the reversion by IEBC to a manual system, was a petition issued before the Supreme Court in both the presidential election mm -hmm. petitions. And in 2017, IEBC's failure to promptly and simultaneously transmit electronically the presidential election results was one of the reasons for the nullification mm -hmm. of the election. Mm -hmm. So what is IEBC doing to avoid the, its previous pitfalls and prepare for 2022? Mm -hmm. Section 44 of the Elections Act gives conditions for the use of technology in a general election. Mm -hmm. According to the law, for the country to use an integrated electronic electoral system, mm -hmm. two things are mandatory. One, IEBC shall procure and put in place the system 120 days before the election. Mm -hmm. Now for the 2022 election, IEBC had the deadline of 11th April. Mm -hmm. And two, IEBC shall test, verify and deploy the technology at least 60 days before the general election. Mm -hmm. For the 2022 election, the electoral system, that electronic system was to be tested, verified and deployed by 10th June, mm -hmm. 10 days ago. Mm -hmm. yep. Now we know that on the D-Day, IEBC tested the system and it failed. Ooh. So could it be that IBC deployed the system as is mm -hmm. to meet the mandatory statutory deadline? Mm -hmm. And what does the failure to meet the deadline mean for the election process and result? Now, number two, according to Anjawala and Abdul Malik, there is another issue. Mm -hmm the procurement of Smartmatic International Holdings, that's the company that gives IT and server support to our electronic system, the one that failed, mm -hmm. and Inform P Lycos Holdings, that's the company that's printing our ballot papers. Both of these have been nullified by the Public Procurement Review Board, but challenged in court. Mm -hmm. However, IBC signed contracts with both companies pending their appeal. That is so optimistic <laughs> because in 2017, Justice Odinga cancelled the tender for the supply and delivery of ballot papers. But at least that time, the cancellation was in February. Mm. This gave IEBC 175 days to redo the tender. Mm -hmm. Now, if our courts uphold the decision for the Procurement Review Board, IBC will have less than 60 days to carry out a competitive tender process. Mm -hmm even if the court allows the existing companies to keep their contracts. The electronic system, its failure and its management by a contested company yes. will feature in the post-August 9th presidential election petition. That's a fact. Yes. And remember, the Supreme Court already issued a public notice that they will nullify the 2022 election mm -hmm. if IBC has not corrected the 2017 issues. Ooh. This is not a good situation. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> it's very dreary if history repeats itself. Mm -hmm. So, a let me change tack. <laughs> According to Albert Amenya in The Star, Wajakoya, aka the Ganja president, is a state project. He says that for Wajakoya to promote marijuana and challenge, it means he has the blessing of the same state that supports Raila. And this got me thinking about covert political warfare. If the state's objective was to force a runoff, then yes, maybe he could be a project of the state. Mm -hmm. Because Tuam told us a few weeks ago, if Raila and Ruto have a dead heat race in August, Wajakoya will ensure that no one gets past 50% plus one threshold. Mm -hmm. This means that even with less than 10,000 votes, Wajakoya can force a runoff. Mm -hmm. Go back, in 2013, Uhuru Kenyatta crossed the 50% plus one threshold with only 8,000 votes. Mm -hmm. This means that if there was a Wajakoya in the 2013 election who got 8,000 votes, the 2013 presidential election would have gone to a runoff. Put differently, Wajakoya may now have a statistical chance of forcing a runoff. Now, according to Amenya, data shows that more than 2 million Kenyans smoke up. Mm -hmm. So just imagine if just some of these 2 million decide to support him. If Wajakoya is a third force, he can actually split the vote. Mm -hmm. Splitting the vote means that the distribution of votes among multiple similar candidates reduces the chance of winning for any of the similar candidates. Let me put this simply. In this case, all three of our um, presidential candidates have populist bases. 
Ruto with the hustlers, Raila has always been the people's president, yes. and Majakoya with the Rastafarians. <laughs> Meaning the distribution effect can occur and make a runoff even more likely. Mm -hmm. Now a classic example was the 1992 American election in which a wealthy Texan named Ross Perot, Perot sorry, restarted his campaign just one month to the election. Mm -hmm. In a contest that was supposed to be between Bush and Clinton, Perot managed to take 18% of the vote yeah. and Clinton ended up with winning 43% of the vote, ousting Bush. Now, Perot and Bush were targeting a similar vote base, rich conservative Republicans, and so they split that vote, giving Bill Clinton the lead. Mm -hmm. In 1992, closer to home, Moy won with just 36% of the vote. Yeah. Matiba had 26%, Kibaki had 19 Jaramogi got 17.5%. Mm -hmm. Had those two not split their Gemma vote base, it would have been a sweeping victory. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to take the conspiracy a notch higher. <laughs> what if this is the work of a foreign choice architect? Between 1947 and 1989, we're told that the US tried to change other nations' governments 72 times. Yep. Obviously, studying covert interventions is tough. The operations are designed so that the intervening state can deny it was involved. Mm -hmm. But meddling in elections is easier than sponsoring military coups. Mm -hmm. US-backed parties have won their elections 75% of the time. Mm -hmm. As Ray Klein, one of the CIA once said, mm -hmm. that the key to a successful covert regime change is supplying just the right bit of marginal assistance in the right way at the right time. Now I wonder in the Kenyan election who the lucky candidate will be this time. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on the Media Police Post. We've put you on notice. See you next Monday.